Bill Easterly spent 16 years working at the World Bank. He's been a professor of economics at NYU for the last 14 years. He's a highly regarded public intellectual. A foreign policy magazine named him among their top 100 global public intellectuals in 2008 and 2009. He tweets, I'm very impressed that you do this. You tweet, I know there are other people who tweet too, but nevertheless, <laughs> I'm impressed you do it. Uh, he tweets at, at Bill Easterly uh, to a broad audience of over 100,000 followers. Very impressive. Um, he's really a well-regarded academic. He is currently ranked 105 among active economists in terms of citations. That's a big deal in the academic world, and it just shows how uh, highly regarded his work is and how highly influential it has been. Uh, he's written uh, almost 100 peer-reviewed articles and three books. Um, the books have often been iconoclastic and have made people rethink the field of development economics and think harder about what they're trying to do. So again, my welcome to Bill Easterly, who is a great economist, a great public intellectual, and a mensch. Bill Easterly. So Dean Brady, thanks so much for that kind introduction. And thanks so much for this visit that you invited me on for the semester here at Berkeley at the Goldman School of Public Policy. It's really been a pleasure. It's an amazingly vibrant, accomplished community. So we're talking tonight about the good neighbor, addressing global poverty in an age of xenophobia. So first, the good news is we've discovered as development economists at least one way that seems to really work for poor people to get out of poverty, which is simply migrating to a richer country. When they do so, they start earning the higher wages characteristic of the richer country, and they get much higher income, which they can share with the country that sent them to the richer country. For example, 82% of Haitians who have ever gotten out of poverty did so by migrating to the US. It's a far more effective development program than all those aid programs, which unfortunately did not work so well in developing the country of Haiti. But unfortunately, rising xenophobia in the US and in Europe is closing off this particular escape route out of poverty, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And what's sad to me as a development economist is we, people, we in the develop, development establishment may have unintentionally contributed in our small way to images that, that do breed xenophobia particularly as there's been a kind of alliance between the global war on poverty and the war on terror. Now, why did that happen and what is it based on? Let me read you a quote. Poverty breeds resentment, hostility, and insecurity. Poor countries provide the optimal anarchic environment for transnational predators. International criminals, as in Haiti, Weapons traffickers, as in Somalia, international terrorists, as in Bosnia, Sudan, and Iraq. It sounded to me when I read that quote a little bit like a Trump speech, to be honest, except the words were a little bit bigger. <laughs> um, but it wasn't a Trump speech. It was a respected Brookings scholar named Susan Rice who said this in 2006, and she later became the national security advisor under the Obama administration. This idea that poverty is the root of terrorism has actually been held in common by both parties since 9-11. <coughs> President Bush, soon after 9-11, in March 2002 at an aid conference, said that we fight against poverty because hope is an answer to terror. And at that aid conference, he agreed to increase US foreign aid substantially under this idea that hope is an answer to terror. And that is why he was providing aid to fight against this poverty. Unfortunately, the subtext of that is if the aid doesn't work to provide hope against poverty, then poor people apparently will be prone to become terrorists. So this unintentionally conveys an image that poor people are prone to terrorism. Uh, not exactly the image that we want to promote if we also are interested in admitting poor people as migrants to get out of poverty. So this view has been remarkably widespread among many different economists, 
think tank people, uh, government officials, cabinet secretaries. Uh, there's a famous book called The Bottom Billion in, in 2007 that said, some citizens of the rich world are going to die as a result of chaos in the bottom billion. So it's almost like we've gone from trying to motivate people to care about development out of compassion, trying to motivate them to care out of fear. Uh, World Bank president and former Bush official Robert Zelik in 2008 said that broken states are the weak link, meaning poor countries, as you can see elsewhere in his speech, the weak link in the global security chain if they are infiltrated by terrorists. Hillary Clinton said in 2010, when she was Secretary of State, we cannot stop terrorism or defeat violent extremism unless we provide hope and a way to catch up to the developed world. So again, very much reiterating the sentiments of President Bush that addressing poverty is the way to fight terrorism and thereby implying that poor people are prone to be terrorists. The World Bank said again in 2011, they dragged on neighbors with violence that overflows borders. Their territories can become breeding grounds for far-reaching networks of violent radicals. And again in 2014, Secretary of State John Kerry said, poverty in many cases is the root cause of terrorism. So we shouldn't complain about these negative images if they are indeed true. Unfortunately, for, these, for this widely accepted idea, these ideas are, are not true. There is no evidence that poverty is the root of terrorism. There have been several careful studies by economists that were available pretty quickly after 9-11 that poverty and terrorism are not closely associated, that terrorists and their supporters tend to be of above average income, above average education. They come from countries of above average per capita income for the developing world. Nevertheless, a significant part of the development world embraced this alliance with the war on terror and thereby lent itself to this image that poor people are prone to be terrorists. Now, some of the more extreme statements of this are, are coming also from uh, some of the celebrities who also participate in mobilizing support for the war on poverty. So if you remember the celebrity activist Bob Geldof, who used to be a rock star a long time ago. Um, sorry, I couldn't get you a better celebrity, but I did my best. Uh, he, he said, uh, war, famine, plague, and death are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and these days they're riding hard through the back roads of Africa. Well, that might be just the ravings of a celebrity, but also that famous development book called The Bottom Billion made a very similar statement that Africa and Central Asia coexist with the 21st century, but their reality is the 14th century, civil war, plague, ignorance. So these statements should not be automatically disqualified again if they are true. Uh, the problem is they're not true. If you want to talk about sort of really bad history, you might go back to the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s. Uh, you might talk about the Napoleonic Wars around 1800. Or you could talk about those barbarians in Europe who created so much uh, catastrophe in the 20th, early 20th century in World War I and World War II that led to a, a, a huge surge in the extent of violence. This is measured precisely as a, a death rate due to war and violence worldwide. So it's the, war, the, death, the wars, that, the, the deaths caused by war divided by the global population at the time in each, each decade shown here. What you can see is at the end, there's a dramatic decline that in fact looks nothing like the 14th or the 16th or the 18th or even the early 20th century, that violence has actually recently declined. <coughs> now look carefully at the axis here which measures deaths per 100,000 population worldwide. Now let's switch to Africa and see if it's like a 14th century war-torn place. There was a war that caused some, some tragic and, uh, and tragic surge in deaths for a while in the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia in 1999. That's the spike that you see here. But then ever since then, the, the death rate from war in Africa has been under five. I remember the previous graph that was going up to 200. Uh, the death rate in war in Africa has been under five consistently ever since 9-11. And if I updated this graph for 2016, it would be very similar, or 2017. 
So Africa does not quite fit the picture of a war-torn place dating from the 14th century. It's in fact, it's in fact true that the death rate from war in Africa is actually lower than the death rate from automobile accidents in the United States. So not exactly accurate to portray Africa as a war-torn continent. Uh, nevertheless, uh, a lot of NGOs and aid agencies have embraced this image. Uh, sometimes they're a little embarrassed about the, the extreme depictions of violence, so they use kind of euphemisms like fragile context. You have to spend many years working in development before you have the genius to invent euphemisms like fragile context <laughs> for meaning war and violence and terrorism. But that's, that's what it means. And again, you see the, the identification of Africa strong in yellow is the fragile context for violence in Central Asia. Again, we've just seen that's not really quite accurate. Uh, how prevalent is conflict? Well, this fragile context concept led to some vagueness because it included anyone who was in a country having a war, even if they were thousands of miles away. But uh, even that only led to a figure of 0.5 billion people live in countries that are classified as fragile states or having a conflict. The conflict is the main definition of what is a fragile state. And then you see a tendency that we've often seen in development, I'm gonna be talking about more, uh, more tonight, which is this tendency to keep escalating how bad the problem is that you're trying to address. So 0 0.5 billion was not quite enough for USAID. They, they thought it was actually 1.5 billion. The same number, the same year, they somehow tripled the actual data number from 0 0.5 to 1.5 billion. Okay, we have 1.5 billion, do I hear 2 billion? <laughs> yes, the World Bank in the same year said it was 2 billion. Yes, two billion people are affected by war. Now, of course, war for its victims is a very tragic thing, and nothing I'm saying tonight takes away from that. But if we're going to characterize whole regions or whole peoples as war-torn places, we want to be a little bit more careful. What kind of data do we have? Well, we do have data on actual deaths from war. The actual deaths from war in 2016 were 0 0.1 million which is 20,000 times smaller than 2.0 billion. Now, of course, war deaths do affect other people, lots of other people, but it doesn't seem quite to justify these numbers. So this is a part of a phenomenon that we've been struggling with in development economics and development efforts for a long time. It's a phenomenon that's been called poverty porn, where there's a tendency to overstate the degree of disaster portray the extreme situations as typical. Uh, a, a writer in development named Alex DeWall said back in 97 that NGOs make habitual inflation of estimates of expected deaths. And to be fair to them, there's a good reason why they do that. They're really trying to get people to pay attention to the tragic problems that exist elsewhere in the world. They need to raise money from uh, rich country publics to do that, both aid dollars that go to, through official channels and contributions to NGOs. And so they stress the, the, the negative images in a way to try to get people to give more, and, they may, and, and indeed they often succeed in doing so. So there is a compassionate side to that, but as the poverty porn critics have realized, it also creates these very negative images of poor people, which also show up in these photographs that you see here. So uh, a recent example of this was uh, an NGO that you all know, Save the Children, did a series of two YouTube videos about violence in Syria, uh, you know, very much designed to kind of get people to care about the violence in Sy Syria. Again, a very good cause, get people to give money to the violence in Syria. So they showed images like this, where you have this very scary image of this guy with the gun in the background, hooded in black, and this young girl in the foreground crouching now, this is actually not a real picture from Syria. This was actually their dramatization of the violence in Syria, which they also decided to feature a British child instead of a Syrian child. This is a British child in the foreground. So their justification for doing that is maybe you would care even more if you could picture a British child or an American child as the victim of these scary guys in the background with guns, and you would care more and you would give more to help address the Syrian crisis, again, these are all very good causes, 
Uh, but then, on the other hand, you're left with an image of a very scary guy in the background with a gun threatening an English child. Are you going to let that guy into the country as a refugee <laughs> or an immigrant? So as I said, this practice and development has been going on for an awful long time. This is a, uh, a record from, that goes all the way back to 1984 called Do They Know It's Christmas? It was done by uh, the celebrity Bob Geldof again, by other famous musicians like Sting and Bono. Uh, this was originally done in a big celebrity concert to raise funds for the Ethiopia famine in 1984. There's also a parallel effort in the US that featured another song called We Are the World that many of you are probably familiar with. So this one, I actually found this album in a used record store in my very small hometown in Ohio and immediately bought it and took a picture of it for this, for this slide. So you can see in the, image, in the image department, you have these sort of, again, these happy English children playing in the background with lots of presents and this kind of degrading image of two African children in the foreground with you know, extreme malnutrition, being tormented by flies, victims of violence. And the lyrics are, uh, some, these are some of the lyrics in the song. I unfortunately can't sing them for you, which would have been a lot more entertaining, but where nothing ever grows. So this is, you know, this, these are lyrics written by Sting and Bono and other famous celebrities you've heard about where nothing ever grows, where no rain or rivers flow. Well, that's not actually true. Um, they could have actually checked a map of Ethiopia that there are actually rivers in Ethiopia. You may have heard of one of them. There's a river called the Nile that goes through Ethiopia. <laughs> uh, Bono could have checked that. It wasn't that hard to check. The Nile goes through Ethiopia. And Bono is also under the strange impression that Ethiopian Orthodox Christians don't know when it's Christmas. <laughs> Sorry, I was expecting that to get a bigger laugh than it did. <laughs> um, this song was re-released in uh, 2014 on the 30th anniversary of this. And again, they're portraying, they're, the, the lyrics this time include phrases like, Africa is a land of hope and of, of dread and fear. Again, resorting on the images of fear, dread, and then it closed with, again, do they know it's Christmas? Bono, 30 years later, has still not learned. <laughs> they, they do know when it's Christmas. That's not the main issue. <laughs> so one, one you know, nice si sign about um, poverty porn is that Africans are fighting back. There's actually a great parody, parody video that was put together by some African musicians that held a fake Africa concert, Africa for Norway. <laughs> Portraying a stereotype of freezing Norwegian children who needed, desperately needed radiators. <laughs> so Africans were going to put out a concert and raise money for radiators for freezing Norwegian children. So uh, in Norway, kids are freezing. I wish I could sing. So uh, Then these beautiful musicians. Now it's Africa for Norway. So this didn't get quite as, many, uh, quite as many subscribers as Bono, but Bono's song, Do They Know It's Christmas, is the second best-selling song in UK history. The first is the Princess Diana Lament by Elton John, which is really setting the bar high. But after that, the best-selling song of all time in the UK is Do They Know It's Christmas. So let's now talk a little bit more about the terrorists. And who are they? So here's uh, someone I'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, so it is true. So again, what we're trying to do here is establish facts. And we're not going to censor out of any facts out of political correctness. We're going to establish what the facts are. So it is true that the perpetrators of most terrorist deaths and attacks in 2015 were mainly Muslim. So it included groups like ISIS, al-Shabaab, Boko Haram. We have people who keep track of this data. And it's true, they, the terrorists are mostly Muslim. So you can, it's, you can make a true statement that the probability that terrorists will be Muslim is indeed high. And that may be what you know, the people who criticize political correctness are talking about and the people who said that 
you know, the Democrats were afraid to talk about radical Islamic terror. Why won't they admit this is true, that the probability that terrorists will be Muslim is high? Uh, that is true. Uh, but it doesn't quite say what people think it says. It doesn't actually tell you whether any random Muslim that you see you know, on the street or on an airplane is a terrorist. This is an example, this picture of this gentleman right here. So the probability that terrorists will, that you have to do the probability the other way around if you want to know if any random Muslim is going to be a terrorist. What fraction of the global population of Muslims are terrorists? So, which is, you know, sometimes there's a confusion. The probability that m terrorists will be Muslim is not the same as the probability that any random Muslim will be a terrorist. So let me give you the number. The probability that Muslims will be terrorists is, let me be very exact here, it's 0 .00003. Uh, so this guy who was kicked off a plane out of suspicion that he was a terrorist because he was, there was a woman sitting next to him on the plane. She noticed he was suspiciously scribbling these mysterious symbols on a piece of paper that seemed to like represent kind of typical terrorist behavior. Uh, and he looked, he looked kind of suspicious. So she called the flight attendant. He was hauled off the plane and interrogated by security, whom he informed that he was not actually a terrorist. He's not even actually Muslim. He was an Italian professor of economics <laughs> doing, doing math for a paper that he was trying to write on the plane. He was using, guilty of using calculus on a plane. Uh, his name is Guido Menzio, and he teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a very well-known theoretical economist, but he did look like a terrorist. So, so you know, even though there is this association of terrorists, terrorists terrorism with Islam, it doesn't actually turn out to be all that useful for, as some people seem to think it is, for ethnically profiling who is a terrorist. It's also not true that this is kind of like a permanent, stable association over, over time. At different times, who the terrorists have been has really radically changed. In the early, early 1970s, as you can see here, the terror, again, this is from a formal database. You know, we're trying hard to sort of get facts to replace innuendo and generalizations and kind of sweeping statements. So this is from a, a database that people have put together of terrorism and its history. So in the early 70s, the IRA were mainly making up the world's terrorists. They were, they were mainly Irish. In the 1980s and 90s, the terrorists were mainly Latin American. It was the Shining Path. and. Uh, Nicaraguan Contras, and then, you know, in, then it's only in the new millennium that we have these Islamic groups emerge. So it's, there's no stable association between any one ethnic group and sort of concentration of terrorists associated with ethnic groups. So what do we learn from all this? There's sort of good and bad news here. The good news is this campaign has been very successful in getting a lot more attention to, to the global war on poverty. I actually felt kind of guilty about this, because I, I really noticed, it, you know, having been in development a long time, I really noticed a big shift upward in the attention being paid to development uh, after 9-11 because of this association that I've told you about tonight. And so, you know, a lot of us in development, we really did benefit from having these new resources and this new kind of wave of attention being paid to development issues. We were glad about that. We were glad to see foreign aid increase. Uh, but it's had all these kind of subsidiary side effects that we've been talking about tonight that it's portrayed, unintentionally portrayed poor people as those who are terrorists. And so, you know, when we've established that one of the main routes that we've really verified over time really works to get people out of, out of poverty is migration, we suddenly see this unintended side effect. We don't really know, I can't, I can't prove to you that there was a strong effect of the development world's association of poverty and terror on the rise of xenophobia. All I can say is we really, all of us, have a responsibility, whether we're in development or whether we're in universities or whether we're participating in any public debates, to be correct and precise about what the facts are. That's our obligation, to just get the truth correct <laughs> and to expose myths, myths, truths, and misstatements and false generalizations. 
as being incorrect. And doing so is itself uh, one small weapon that we can use in the war on xenophobia to open up the, the doors once again to the best, one of the best escape routes out of poverty, which is migration. And you know, as an economist, I have to say, a lot of what's going on with xenophobia is so much contrary to the econom economist way of thinking. It portrays a world, an ugly world of kind of zero-sum struggle between conflicting groups, which of course really does happen sometimes. But the real story on global development has been the amazing interactions of individuals who are not primarily defined by ethnic group. They're defined as individuals who find ways to do voluntary transactions with other individuals that makes both sides better off, that's a positive sum gain, that's gains from trade, that's gains from voluntary transactions in which both sides benefit. So an individual immigrant participates in a voluntary exchange where they bring his or her services to a new country where someone wants, wants those services, whether it's uh, low-skilled services or it's Nobel Prize-winning services. It's, the principle is still the same. So I hope tonight we can use some of these facts to join the fight against xenophobia and continue the, the, the roads that were open to our ancestors to get out of poverty through migration and not confront a wave of xenophobia when we arrive. Thank you very much.